Well, thanks, of course, to, to uh, Stan and others for inviting me here to, um, to say a few things. So um, it's, it's weird that um, I've been around for long enough that I'm considered sufficiently venerable to <coughs> give an overview talk to make some, uh, uh, Jens, I think, suggested I give a historical sort of background about this. So I had that suggestion. And Hendrik, who I was talking to yesterday, suggested that I talk for as short a time as possible. I'm not quite sure uh, <laughs> what exactly what he was getting at there, but uh, I'll try and meet these two, uh, these two suggestions as much as I can. So I thought I'd make just a few brief comments about traits versus environment and trait co-variation and trade-offs, that being the, the title of this, of this session, which leads me naturally into a pet subject of mine, ecological strategy dimensions and how we can understand them via plant traits. And then I just thought I'd sneak in a little bit of actual empirical research um, about climate drivers of leaf size variation, which is a topic that <laughs> Colin t touched on yesterday in his talk, <coughs> excuse me, and a few people asked about later, so I thought I'd pop those slides in as well. Okay, so if you think about what's, what the sorts of things people have been talking about at this conference and what's on the posters and what happens at lunchtime and dinner, there's all sorts of different things on people's minds when they talk about plant traits. Some people are interested in understanding the relationship between plant structure and function. Others uh, want to use traits as a shortcut to understanding something more difficult about plant physiology or ecological function. Personally, I have this tendency to try and understand plant ecological strategies through the lens of plant traits and um, others for parameterizing vegetation models and, and so forth. Obviously, it's a very broad church, this trait church. I'm giving you a sermon here right now. <laughs> But uh, if you go back a century, it wasn't quite so much a broad church. Um, some, of the, some of the early papers, uh, people measuring plant traits, of course, they didn't call them traits so much then, uh, up on the, the screen now. <clears throat> Edith Clements, for example, uh, from the University of Nebraska more than a century ago, did a beautiful study quantifying the detailed leaf anatomy of over 300 species in Colorado, <clears throat> measuring the thickness and, um, of different tissue types and, and looking at the relationship to aridity. Herb Hansen. Uh, also at the University of Nebraska, also influenced by Frederick Clements, who's a you know, very important person in plant ecology. He was interested in leaf morphology in relation to light environment. So he showed, for example, that uh, uh, species growing in the shade typically had leaves with high SLA and high water contents. Okay, this is the sort of thing that's still of interest to us today. Over on the East Coast, Irving Bailey had a long and illustrious career uh, measuring uh, wood traits. Um, particularly placing that into an evolutionary context. And he was, his early work was also uh, focused on looking at leaf margins in relation to climate. And finally, Christian Ronquier, who's well known in plant ecology for all sorts of ideas, he had a real interest in looking at leaf size in communities, but particularly looking at the whole suite or whole set of leaf size strategies you saw in any given environment. He'd measure the leaf size of all the co-occurring species and represent that as a spectrum or as a statistical distribution and say, how does this distribution shift between one type of environment and another? Can we use this to understand the, um, the way that there's convergence to particular environmental pressures in different places? A remarkably modern idea, or to put it another way, maybe it's a very old idea when, when we look at it today. Right, so there's, there's tons of papers about trait environment relationships in the literature. Here's you know, sort of a, a non-random selection of two um, from 2015. Uh, on, on the left there, there's a lovely paper by Owen and a, a cast of 60, I think, um, showing the relationship between dark respiration standardised to 25 degrees and temperature of the warmest quarter. On the right hand um, uh, graph there, that's the leaf photosynthetic rate at light saturation in relation to soil pH. Okay, there's all sorts of interesting kind of features about these graphs, but I wanted, what I wanted to emphasise was that if you look at a graph like this, the um, amount of variation in the y-axis at any given value of x is far greater than the mean difference between one end of the whole line than the other. Okay, so the within site variation is really very considerable. So getting away from trying to understand how traits relate to environment, I think it's really interesting to try and understand why there's so much trait variation within sites. This is something that we don't do very well yet in models, and I think it's something that um, will probably receive a lot more attention in the next, next decade. And it's also, given that Peter gave such a wonderful introduction talk the other day, I thought I'd try and think of something different to say today. Um, but anyway, when I'm trying to understand what's happening within um, any set of co-occurring species, I'm really thinking about the coexistence of different ecological strategies and in turn how traits help us understand different ecological strategies and then of course how traits relate to one another. And this is this topic of co-variation which I've been asked to talk about. So, of course when traits are correlated there's a whole lot of reasons that they may be correlated. There could be a direct causal relationship between trait Y and trait X. There could be some indirect correlation. Um, 
via some <coughs> third or fourth or fifth variable. Or perhaps there's the traits can be considered as coordinated with one another. And a particular type of coordination, of course, we think of about it as compromises or trade-offs, which is also in the title of the symposium. Trade-offs are actually really interesting. In fact, that's, that's the key thing I think we need to understand about trait variation. So I'll come back to that theme again and again. Of course, a, a trade-off implies a choice, maybe on a physiological, ecological, or evolutionary timescale between the expenditure of finite resource between competing functions or outcomes. And very often it's expressed as a negative relationship. People often say, ah, oh, look, there's a negative relationship, it's a trade-off. Um, I think we need to be a bit more careful in our, in our thoughts sometimes. Certainly some things are trade-offs. For example, up on the right here, there's a relationship between seed mass and seed number for a bunch of species in eastern Australia. This is an enforced trade-off in the sense that for a given amount of reproductive effort, it can be packaged into many small seeds or very few large seeds. Okay, so there's, there's a sort of a logical reason that these things trade off. In the bottom left-hand corner is a, a lovely plot from an old paper by Chris Field and others from the early 80s showing the negative relationship between water use efficiency during photosynthesis and nitrogen use efficiency. And here we also have a negative relationship, but here the, the interpretation, of course, is this is a coordination between different or a co-optimization of different needs of a plant, the nitrogen use efficiency and water use as well. But trade-offs always don't have to be negative. So uh, here's a lovely plot that I call the, the L-graph. Um, the L-graph shows the trade-off between monoterpene and isoprene emission capacities amongst 192 species measured in the field. And of the 400 data points in that, in that plot, about 80% of them sit along the y-axis or along the x-axis. But of course, what's glaringly obvious with a plot like this is that the whole, whole <coughs> right-hand corner is completely empty. Um, the empty space in plots like this is just as interesting to me as where the data is. This is another version of what Colin said yesterday, of where we sometimes were very interested in the things that are completely unrelated. Um, in this case, they're unrelated because there's an underlying metabolic reason. It wasn't until we got together with people who understood the pathways that we realised that it sort of makes sense that, that plants either specialise in one or the other of these volatile organic carbon emission types. Okay, so here's a very kind of classic sort of uh, um, uh, trait relationship um, that uh, Peter Reich wrote about a lot in the 1990s, um, the relationship between leaf lifespan and leaf structure, here represented as, as uh, leaf lifespan versus LMA. In a very important paper from 1999, Peter uh, explored this idea of empty space and said, it came up with the sort of argument there are different reasons for different types of empty space. So in, in a plot like this, uh, there may be biophysical constraints sort of pushing down the, the data points from one, one direction and ecological selection pushing up from the other. So to dig into this a bit deeper, of course, there's some sort of causal relationship between leaf mass per area and leaf lifespan, at least at some level. Uh, at least in the sense that to achieve a long lifespan, leaves need to be made of pretty tough stuff. Um, presumably, evolution pushes um, species up <coughs> in, in this graph such that they would uh, it'd be more economic or more competitive to achieve a longer leaf lifespan or to have a longer duration of the investment of the biomass in, in leaves um, for a given leaf mass per area. So in some sense, that upper left-hand corner must be ideal, but unattainable. So it's an interesting research question, why species aren't all pushing up against that, what it means to be further away from that line, and so forth. And of course, there's very strong patterning according to climate within a, a graph space like this, and that's something we explored in a lot of those early papers. And in the bottom right-hand corner, presumably, this is sort of the loser corner, the uncompetitive or uneconomic strategy would be to build expensive leaves and to jettison them after a short amount of time. Anyway, so the general point I'm trying to make is it's interesting to think about where the data points are and also where they're not and what those underlying reasons are. Because when we're trying to understand ecological strategies, that's really what we're talking about. By plant ecological strategy, I mean in the simplest form, simply how plants compete for resources and get these resources, how they cope with environmental and biotic pressures, and of course, in the end, how they ensure genetic continuity to future generations. There's a long history of people um, uh, talking about ecological strategies. I think Sandra um, showed a nice slide with uh, many um, of the people in that. I just wanted to mention these three English gentlemen, um, Phil Grime, Peter Grubb, Mark Westerby, have all made kind of major contributions to this field. I'm going to elaborate a bit more on the, the sort of Westerby um, view of how to understand plant ecological strategies in relation to traits, because I've been very strongly influenced by working with Mark for quite a few years. Okay, so the idea here is we, we want to understand plant ecological strategy dimensions and how we can understand the position of a species along a dimension in relation to its plant traits. So, of course, first of all, we have to um, 
uh, identify the, the ecological strategy dimensions, uh, identify the traits that index the position along these things. Um, and by key dimension, I mean a dimension that represents a key ecological um, uh, strategy trade-off, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. For this to be useful at all, species need to be widely spread along the dimensions, traits must be readily measurable, and the whole aim here is to try and develop a cost-benefit understanding of the trait differences. By that I mean, what are the costs and benefits of a species being at one end of the spectrum or another? Uh, how does this relate to where species grow best? How do traits vary in relation to environment? When you think about the interpretation, does it, is it different if you're considering the trade-offs within co-occurring species or along environmental gradients? These are the sorts of questions that we ask and how traits map onto different lifestyle choices, phenology and so forth. Um, and that, if we go back to that list, this is, the, this is from this 2002 annual reviews paper that we wrote where we came up with a sort of a roadmap for where we thought plant ecology or now called trade ecology should, should go um, using this sort of framework. Um, and at the time, it was quite a modern thing to say that uh, what was really good about this is it would bring worldwide meta-analysis within reach. And of course, 15 years later, we're in a much data-rich world where we, all th we are thoroughly meta-analysed. Um, uh, this is you know, sort of part of our, our standard toolbox now, whereas back then it was sort of an aspirational goal. So in relation to this short list of key trait dimensions, that's not terribly controversial, some of these dimensions come up again and again. There's an idea that um, of reproductive, reproductive allocation, seed, the reproductive output can be divided into, as I said, small seeds and large seeds. And this is more technically a competition colonisation trade-off. And that's common to all sessile organisms. You can use the same thing to understand corals, for example. With this um, leaf economics spectrum beast that we've been hearing about. But at its heart, it's a, a trade-off between construction cost and, and leaf lifespan. Um, there's a, a, obviously a spectrum in, to do with um, height, not only the maximum height that species reach during their lifespan, but how they get there, uh, the ontogenetic um, height growth trajectory. In a, um, in a trait um, strategy spectrum like plant height, there's a, a number of um, sort of interrelated trade-offs there. And I think at least some of them can be best understood in a game theoretic sense, <coughs> which is to say that there's no point trying to understand what the optimal height strategy is in it, without the understanding the competitive arena in which a species occurs, because the only reason plants grow tall, of course, is to preempt the light resource from, from, their, from, from their competitors. Um, okay, so in the 2002 paper and in the 2006 sort of update, we waved our arms a little bit and said, okay, so if we use this sort of framework, what other sorts of trait dimensions do we need to try and understand? And clearly there's a lot of variation among species in the size of the leaves and the allometry of the, um, of the leaves and the twigs. And this relates to support costs, canopy arch architecture and so forth. And we noted that there was a lot of variation, but we didn't yet understand the key trade-offs there. Similarly, at the time, there was a huge amount of activity in the area of nutrient stoichiometry. You think about the books by, book by Jim Elser and um, um, Bob Sterner, um, you know, it was a really kind of hot topic. Clearly, there's a lot of variation in stems, hazards, uh, survival, hydraulics, and so forth, and clearly roots. So I think it's an interesting question for us today to revisit this sort of list and say, where are we up to today? What are the key trait dimensions? Not purely from an from a academic point of view of trying to understand ecological strategies, because, but also because the idea of these independent dimensions are things that one might include in a vegetation model. So this is the sort of thing that I talk about quite a bit with people like Colin and last night with uh, Kirsten over, over dinner. You know, what are the things we really need to model? What's orthogonal? What's, what's correlated? And so forth. You know, just to give an example, leaves vary in a myriad of beautiful, amazing ways. Um, there's these leaf, leaf economic traits, and uh, especially when considered on an area basis, there's a partially orthogonal axis of uh, photosynthetic traits, CO2 drawdown, leaf size, venation density, conductivity, and of course, a whole list of other things that I haven't mentioned. So the question I'm interested in when I look at all this variation <coughs> is which traits index strategy dimensions, which can really be understood in terms of that, that sort of framework, um, and which are orthogonal from one another. So for example, uh, on the bottom left there, there's a scatter plot showing the relationship or lack thereof between LMA and leaf size from Sandra's paper. And um, the p-value is vanishingly small, but the R squared is less than 5%. You know, for all intensive purposes, LMA and leaf size are you know, thoroughly unrelated. So these are clearly kind of different types of dimensions. On the other hand, here the, the bottom right shows a relationship between leaf size on the y-axis and the inverse of secondary vein density. Um, 
uh, slightly peculiar, but the point is that the vein, vein properties in leaves scale very tightly with the leaf size. Okay? So these things probably all collapsing into one sort of dimension, at least considering the secondary veins. There's been a lot of interest in that in the last few years from coming from a lot of labs and, and groups. Okay, in wood, there's at least two, con two conceptually independent strategy dimensions. This is you know, nothing new. There's this idea that um, construction cost indexed by wood density trades off against mortality. Um, and more recently, I suppose there's been a lot of interest in hydraulics literature about this um, so-called safety efficiency trade-off in, in plant hydraulics. That is, that species that have a high KS, that's the y-axis here, um, never have a high or a very negative P50. Okay, so P50 is the water potential which uh, species can withstand before they embolize. There's so much empty space up in that right-hand corner. Um, Sean, when he wrote this paper, was able to fit a whole nother graph in there. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's how, how wonderful that is. Although having said that, when you log scale the axes, the, the trade-off isn't quite as neat, but it's still there, I, I suppose. So there's two, at least two dimensions there happening in wood, but there's a lot of other things in, in uh, sapwood as well. So some nice work by Kasia Zeminska, who was a PhD student with us at Macquarie a couple of years ago. Um, she showed that there appears to be this trade-off between the proportion of parenchyma in wood and the proportion of fibres. So this, in this graph here, there's 60 data points, each representing a different species from four different sites in eastern Australia. And as you can see, there's a nice tight negative relationship. It's about as tight as things ever get in my world. Um, the question, of course, what does this mean? How do we interpret it? Well, parenchyma is the living tissue in sapwood, so it has a range of functions. But one in particular that's of interest, particularly the ray parenchyma, um, is that it's involved in embolism refilling. So the question then becomes, is there some sort of trade-off between the ability to refill emboli um, and the strength of wood? If so, is this orthogonal or parallel to these other, other trait strategy dimensions that I've just described, that between wood density and mortality, that between safety and efficiency? And then, well, what about sapwood respiration? What about tissue nitrogen and so forth? I mean, my hunch is this is all going to collapse down to a couple of dimensions, but we don't really know that yet. We're only getting to the point now of getting data sets that are sufficiently large to really understand these sorts of issues. Um, so this is a plea for people who are looking around for things to do. Measure wood anatomy, it's great. You know, we can learn a lot by just kind of doing basic stuff, the same sort of stuff that Irving Bailey was doing 100 years ago and, um, and, uh, and Clements as well. So of course this brings us to the question of is there a whole plant economic spectrum and there's this you know, beautiful paper by Peter from a couple of years ago about that. Um, and really at the heart of that, there's this question is, do all or most variation in, in traits uh, related to vegetative, vegetative growth, does it all collapse down to a single dimension or not? And this comes back to the question, well, okay, so how many key trait strategy dimensions are there? I'm interested in this, as I said, from a sort of a theoretical perspective. Modelers are interested uh, uh, about this from a, you know, a making simple models perspective. So where are we at? I'm not saying there's a definitive list, this is still a work in progress. 15 years later, it's still a work in progress. I think, what, two, three dimensions in leaves? Colin would say four. Wood, one or two. Roots, we have no idea. I was hoping to say something definite about this. I was like, hey, my talk's on day three. I'll say something kind of definite about roots. But actually, I'm more confused about roots than when I came in a couple of days ago. It's so fantastic to see all this work happening in that, in that area. But I, I guess we don't know if there's a root economic spectrum or not. If there is, how orthogonal it is with these other things or not. And clearly, there's a whole lot of variation at plant height as well. So. So my a plea, I suppose, is simply to ask when you're looking at all the trait variation in your data set, in your pet trait, whatever your pet trait may be, is how is the variation partitioned? Let's try and understand that. Is it between species, within species? If it's within species, does it vary along environmental gradients, you know, within canopies and so forth? Standard sorts of questions. Um, it's receiving a lot more attention in the literature now, which is a good thing. Um, but with my plant strategy hat on, I want to know what is the underlying trade-off that generates this kind of variation? Can we develop a cost-benefit understanding? And can we describe the rules in terms of simple equations? I think this is really key as well for a meeting such as this, because if we can describe those rules, we can model it. Okay? Um, and then we can uh, potentially test those, the model, test the rules using trait databases. And I think this is an you know, exciting um, time for us uh, in functional ecology where we can really bring together um, modelers and, and so empirical scientists and so forth, as if these are two groups who are separate, um, and uh, making progress in that way. So on that, I've still got a few minutes, so I thought I'd give a quick example of um, 
It's the work we've been doing on global climatic controls on leaf size, which is just to, to illustrate this sort of idea of bringing together simple models and uh, empirical data. Now, Colin actually spoke about this yesterday and a few people asked me about it last night, so I figured it was worth putting a few slides in about that. So let's think about leaves again. So there's something like 10 to, 10 to the 5 fold variation in leaf size among species. We saw some very small leaf species yesterday out on the moor, didn't we? The heather, the leaves are less than one square millimetre in size. And of course, there's those, those weird species that, uh, that like the Victoria, is it Victoria, Sandra, the big water lily? There's you know, leaves like that. But you know, most, most species don't have leaves like that, but there's still a million fold variation or 100,000 vari fold variation. Now this is nothing new. Schimper and Varming in the 1890s thought this was very interesting. They, uh, they really kind of talked it up in their, their early plant geography textbooks. Um, and then it captured the public's imagination through works like uh, this one by uh, Henri Rousseau, who painted a whole, lot of, a whole series of paintings about the, the steamy kind of tropics, the steamy sort of slightly you know, seductive, sexy tropics or something that is all mysterious and is characterised by large leaf species. Um, so for quite a long time, we've been wondering you know, what, is the, uh, what really drives this, this leaf size variation, particularly this sort of latitudinal gradient between the tropics and other places. Not a new question. In the 60s and 70s and 80s, when optimality theory was kind of cool, um, there was quite a lot of activity in this, in this area. So there's a whole bunch of uh, models um, that all, in their various ways, consider the water costs um, of leaf size relative to the photosynthetic benefits. And um, this is related to the energy balance considerations that Colin spoke about yesterday. Um, so the predictions from these models in, in, in common are that we'd expect to see smaller leaves at drier sites, smaller leaves at higher irradiance, smaller leaves at hotter sites. And this is all about the, um, by avoiding um, or the water costs of transpiration pushing leaves in, in this direction. And of course, there's, like any good modelling paper, you provide a model and then some data that supports it. And all these uh, papers had some, some data supporting their, their predictions. So what we thought we'd do uh, was have a look at this in more detail. About 10 years ago, I'm pretty slow at things, about 10 years ago, I uh, got to put a data set together, pre-try for global leaf size. Um, <clears throat> so there's 650 sites, 7,900 7, species. Um, and then more recently, we decided to try and model the variation in leaf size, particularly the climate-driven limits to maximum leaf size. So here's a nice scatter plot showing uh, what we know about leaf size in relation to latitude across the world. Um, absolutely, it's true, there's larger leaves in the tropics. There's also a lot of variation at any given latitude. Um, but of course, going back to the optimality theories, the point is that the tropics are both warmer and wetter. So we'd expect that you have larger leaves in wetter places, but the prediction is for smaller leaves at hotter places. Okay, so clearly there's some sort of interaction between site temperature and moisture that um, needs to be considered, and strangely hadn't really been considered in the literature very much until now. So here's a, a three-way graph between leaf size on the y-axis, or the vertical axis, mean temperature the warmest month, and mean annual precipitation, showing that globally speaking, this is a twisted plane. Okay, so it's absolutely true that you get smaller leaves at hot sites, but only if these sites are dry. So that's this part of the graph down the front here. If you go to wetter sites at the back part of the graph, leaf size increases very strongly with site temperature. Okay, so it's just a more nuanced kind of understanding of what's going on here, and it all sort of makes, makes sense now. So moving on from that, we're interested in really what sets the, the limits to leaf size. And this relates a bit to the question of, that Sandra was asking the blob as well. What's, what really kind of sets the outer shell here? And here we try to, to deal with this in a sort of first principles way. So this basic idea of taking a, an approach developed for canopies and applying it to, to individual leaves, Priestley-Taylor, posits that there's a maximum transpiration rate of leaves or canopies that can be set by the, um, defined by the net, net radiation balance and the temperature. Boundary layer thickness of leaves is by definition proportional to leaf size. And using this and um, kind of some simple algebra, you can show that you can um, calculate a leaf boundary layer conductance um, and a corresponding leaf size that will keep leaves under 50 degrees or whatever temperature you nominate at the hottest time of year. Okay, so that's a criterion for what's the maximum viable leaf size. The largest leaf that can hang out there in the sun at the hottest time of year and not overheat, providing there's some water to transpire. Also in there is a, an assumption about um, water conditions in the, in the sites. And by definition, you see, if there's less water that can be transpired, the maximum viable leaf size must be smaller. Okay, so this is the sort of way we understand a lot of variation among co-occurring species underneath that maximum viable leaf size. There may be a whole host of reasons why species have a strategy that um, involves slower transpiration or because the, the soil moisture is, is, um, is declining, that sort of thing. 
Okay, so it's a zero order model or first order model, whatever that means, um, about trying to understand the, the outer limits to leaf size. Um, there's also an equivalent model uh, about what's happening at night. This is to do with leaves losing radiation um, and energy to the to nighttime sky and the risk of radiated frost damage. So this is um, well known in agricultural circles, but not uh, so much elsewhere. Ray Luning had a lovely paper on it in uh, the late 80s and a couple in the 90s. And here our criterion is we, want, we wanted to define the leaf size that corresponds to leaves not freezing um, uh, during the coldest time of year, during the growing season. Anyway, so of these two criteria, um, you, you end up with two predictions for leaf size at any given site. And the final prediction is the smaller of the two predictions. And well, this works sort of in review at the moment, and I didn't really want to jinx it. Um, it's at a, at a journal that can be a little bit sensitive about um, putting results up. So just let me say this, you'll have to believe me, that um, we have some lovely global maps of leaf size and the underlying drivers. There's nice agreement, good agreement between the predicted and the observed, and hopefully it'll you know, come out. I'll be able to show the graphs sometime before too long. So the key message from that part of the talk is that the direction of, of, of leaf size in relation to site temperature or irradiance strongly depends on water availability. So sort of with hindsight, maybe it's sort of obvious, but it really wasn't appreciated before. It's very cool to be able to show that night chilling is important as well as day, uh, day heating. It really um, pushes our, our understanding quite a bit forward, I think. We've got this nice simple leaf temperature model, which potentially is useful for, for vegetation modelling. Um, and the reason I went to all this trouble telling you about this is because I think it's a nice illustration that progress can be made by twinning global data sets with simple modelling. And on that, I'd like to invite you to ask some questions or make some comments. Thank you.